So here it is from Genesis 18, um, 1 through 5, or 1 through 15, and then Genesis 21, 18 to uh, 1 through 7. All right. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, my Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf tender and good and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, there in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season and your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with her after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself saying, after I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time, I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, oh, yes, you did laugh. <laughs> we continue in Genesis 21. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his own age, old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son whom Sarah bore him. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who, who hears will laugh with me. And she said, who would ever have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Wow. So shall we, would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our redeemer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Sarah had heard this story before hadn't she? She'd actually heard it several times from God's lips. She'd also probably heard it numerous times from Abraham as well, because they had to keep this dream alive for many, many years. God had promised Abraham a son, a son birthed by Sarah herself. In chapter, we are in chapter 18, but back, way back in chapter 15, God vows that Abraham will have descendants like the stars in the sky. And their names go, and, and to mark this, Sarai and Abram become Abraham and Sarah. This is a big moment, right? 
And then again, in just in chapter 17, when Ishmael had been born, God continued to say, nope, Sarah's going to have a baby. This is not your heir. And Abraham, even in that moment, says, we're 190. Are you not? <laughs> and now in chapter 18, these strangers whom Abraham had recognized as Yahweh, as God, uh, coming into his midst, even then, these guys are saying it's going to happen, and it's going to happen soon. You can't fault Sarah for laughing, can you? Because she it's a story that, that seems like it can't happen now. Now that she's old, now that she's come to terms with what her life is and will be, her barrenness, now that there's this other son, Ishmael, now that it's even more complicated, God, you are going to keep your promise now? Are you nuts? Of course she laughs. Of course she laughs. Because these three visitors have brought an unraveling, an unraveling of their life, a paradigm shift that leads to a new reality, a deeper reality. Hmm. There are lots of reasons that what they're saying cannot be true. Sarah is old. She's in the way into menopause. She hasn't been able to conceive before this. And yet, as the story unfolds, we are reminded, is anything too astonishing for God? We have Sarah's laughter in our ears as we are told of the birth of Isaac to this couple. And we cannot help but laugh too. And we have no wonder about why they named him Isaac, he who laughs. Is anything too astonishing for God? That is kind of our question this morning. Is anything too astonishing for God? Can God unravel our stories and ravel them back up? Even in the midst of, of, of tremendous change and challenge to the status quo? I think the answer is yes. I think the answer is yes. But we need to be careful about how we talk about what is too astonishing for God. Because sometimes that leads us into a troublesome theology that has us wrapped up in, in thinking that if, you're, if you don't get all the, the answers you want from God, that, that God isn't doing those for you, that God is, is somehow abandoned you. Like, like when childless couples are told they're never going to have children the way that, that, that Sarah and, Isaiah and, and, and Abraham have been talking and, and experiencing, or, or when we realize that we've lost somebody before their time, or at least before we wanted them to go. But what we think we are talking about when we talk about is anything too astonishing for God is that we are reminded of this story and of our own stories, that God is in the midst of humanity. We do not make decisions alone, apart from a loving God, and God does not give us all that we ask for. Instead, God is with us as we struggle and, and work and discern what God wants of us and of the world. Nothing is too astonishing for God, who made it and loves it all. And so we see in Sarah's story and in our stories, when we thought that we had it all figured out, arranged just so. And, the ground, and then the ground-shaking event comes. Now, it could be an earthquake, but that's not really what I'm talking about, although we have felt those this week as well. But, but I think about 
the, 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 the ground shaking changes that come in our lives that we were not expecting, we were not planning for, was not plan part of the vision. I think about my own story. I'm, a, I'm the baby in my family by a good significant amount. My sister is 16 years older than me and my brother is nine years older than me. My parents had no idea that I could come. They had no idea that as they approached middle age, they would be forced back into diapers and bottles again. But you know what? I wouldn't be here for one if that wouldn't ha didn't happen. But I also know that I have, that, that, my, that my surprise has been a blessing, that my surprise arrival has been a blessing to my family, that, that my sister can't even imagine what it would be like to not have this baby sister. Good job, huh? But, 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 but it, was a, it, was a, it was a, it was a ground shaking change, right? Right? To, to go from two to three kids, just when you thought you were going to be able to, to do all those things, maybe when you thought you'd already done all those significant trips you needed to do. There's a whole bunch of the camping that I never got to do because my siblings did it before me. There are transitions in our lives that are good news like this, right? That bring changes in our story, bring changes in our, in our understanding that are sometimes hard to accept and hard to get used to. I think about that transition that, that some of us in our, in our congregation are gonna be going through here in a little while, that transition from junior high to high school or that transition from, from elementary school to junior high to high school to college or, or, or high school to the working world or college to the working world, all those transition points of our lives. Do you guys remember those? Remember that the awkwardness and the, 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 the sometimes the discomfort and pain of those transitions, even though they are good news, right? We're growing, we're changing, but they come with some, some tension. They come with some, some unraveling of what we thought we were and how we thought we were going to be. I think about some other places that that happens, vocational changes, that new job in a different field or the, the new role in your current job where maybe you become a manager instead of a line employee. Maybe, maybe you have something else. Maybe there's a transition in your life like retirement by choice or by somebody else's decision. But the children leaving the nest, like how many of you have experienced when your child moves out, it's a joyous thing, right? They're growing up and they're becoming their own person. And yet it comes with some transition. It comes with some upsetting of the apple cart. It comes with some decisions that maybe you wouldn't have made that they make that you have to help uh, or have a, have a, have a attention with, right? We, we, there's also some tensions that have no, hard to say have joy in them, right? Like, like things like divorce or loss or layoff that sometimes surprise us. They weren't part of our plan, but, but God moves with us and through us and in us in those situations. I think of our current situation of the pandemic as one of these, right? We are surprised by our reactions to this, of, 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 the, of the tension between wanting to be safe and wanting to just be back to normal. I think we're gonna learn, I think we're already learning a lot about who we are and what makes us tick and what makes it significant for us. Why we want to be in community on Sunday morning together, why we need to be in community together on Sunday morning with one another. <sighs> these loose ends, these unravelings, these places of, of, of perhaps the, a breaking of the fabric that we thought we could rely on, the, 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 and the mending and the, the transformation and the transfiguration of those fabrics of our very lives. Those, all those things, those beginning places can, can feel adrift. 
But as we begin to discern with God how to create this new reality, whether it's the, the new reality of a, of a new life within our, within our family, or it's the reality of, of growth and development that means change, even so. We love the reality. We, we, we love what we are comfortable with. But we also need to remember that at one point, maybe we weren't as comfortable with it as we are now. And that God leads in these surprising ways, in surprising situations that we would never say, oh, there's going to be hope here. We are surprised all the time. We laugh with God because nothing is impossible. No surprise is too small or too big for God to, to make real in our lives. The thing is, is that, that in the midst of all this churning change and unraveling and re-raveling, I, love, I like saying raveling as we're using this word unraveling, Right? But all this raveling, this making, making whole and making new, all this that is happening is, 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 a, is, is, is reminds us that, that, that what, a, what a scandal and a difficulty faith is. Our, um, Walter Brueggemann, who's a theologian, says, Faith is not a reasonable act which fits into the normal scheme of life and perception. The promise of the gospel is not a conventional piece of wisdom that is easy to accommodate with everything else. Embrace of the radical gospel requires shattering and discontinuity. 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 Ooh, that's a big word. That's a $5 word, right? Abraham and Sarah by this time have become accustomed to their barrenness. They are resigned to their closed future and have accepted that the hopelessness as normal. The gospel promise does not meet them in receptive hopefulness, but in resistant hopelessness. Sarah laughs because God made laughter for her. By his powerful word, God has broken the grip of death, hopelessness, and barrenness. The joyous laughter is the end of sorrow and weeping. Laughter is a biblical way of receiving a newness which cannot be explained. And the newness, this raveling, as we are talking about, is a sheer gift, underived, unwarranted. For Sarah, barrenness has become ludicrous. It can now be laughed at because there is, because full joy is present. So in these times of struggle, in these times where we wish we could be gathered in the same room, where we wish we could hug one another, where we wish we could be the church that God has created us to be, let us be the church that God is creating us to be. The church that says the walls are not containing us. The church that says we, say, we value the safety of our brothers and sisters. The church that says wholeness and healing is on its way. Amen. Amen.